Well, I just wanted to ask you that. Yeah, I no, want, that's good. That's it, good. I'm in there. I was in there doing paperwork again the other day, and, and I saw Caitlin uh, uh, walk in, and she does, and I'm going, oh, can I ask her about that again? Because <laughs> she gets so frustrated when she's in a hurry. Yes. Yes. Um, and he had said, yeah. He said, I can do it. He says, just let me know. And, yep. Okay. And I think you use one of the ones we have in the room now already. I think so. Yeah, so that would be fine. All right, friends. Here we go. I have a few extra copies. <laughs> some more out, I guess. Publisher give you the option to stable, right? And, uh, I'm gonna print out. I'm gonna print County Sheriff's Department and just all those folks, us on 911, all those guys, man, they're all feeling it right now um, with uh, Deputy Collada's death um, two weeks ago now, roughly. So, pretty tragic situation there. So, we'll just pray for the family. <laughs> That's what the paper said this morning was the memorial service would be this Friday, 1 o'clock, at Church for All Nations. And, um, you know, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Working on getting rid of my frog here. So I'm not sure um, schedule-wise, but uh, I'm thinking maybe if a group wanted to meet here at noon, we could meet here at noon, have a little devotion and prayer as, as ourselves, because I don't know what kind of a service this is going to be. My guess is it's going to be more of a just a remembrance and less of a worship service. So we could do like a little devotion here and then go as a group over to Church for All Nations if you wanted to. So I think it would be nice to show support for our community and and you know this is a always anytime you know a frontline worker like this is is killed in this way. It really it really hits pretty deep. So Sure, and we've got, yes, yes, we've got police officers um, that work in the congregation or have worked, so so I think that would be a good thing to do, and uh, <coughs> and as a very, very much a separate thing altogether, um, it's always, it's always nice to get inside another church and see what things look like and how things go and We'll get a chance to talk. This is, this seems like a, a horrible segue. I apologize, <laughs> um, but we will get a chance to talk about church ar architecture. And when your when your worship goals are different, your church architecture is very different too. So, okay. Um, so we'll keep that um, <clears throat> family and in our community and our prayers. To anything else to uh, pray for? Recovery, Jim. Shall we pray for that? All right. Hop, hop. On a level, how 
How's your appendix? <laughs> Up. All right. Good. And the family too. Yeah. Yeah. So Pastor got kind of had a little. I shouldn't say a little. He had appendicitis this last week, and he still has a, his appendix. Got it. So they didn't take it out. They didn't take it out. They said no. Jim was like, no, leave it in there. <laughs> I think you would have preferred them take it out, probably. Yeah, I think I would be too. But with his other health concerns, they were a little bit concerned with the uh, uh, use of anesthesia, so they didn't want to uh, cause any side issues with that. So we'll just pray for that, the family, and that his uh, his appendicitis uh, stays calm. I don't know what. What do you do to take care of an appendix? Do you eat, eat better? I don't know. It's just, I don't think we really know what the appendix does anyway. So, Okay, let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for this day. As always, we, we come to you in humility and thankfulness uh, for what you've done for us. And we ask for your blessings upon our study today. Uh, Lord, we pray for... Uh, the family of Officer Collada, who was killed in the line of duty, be with his family, be with our community, keep us safe. Um, use this as an opportunity for good Christian people to show love and compassion to that family and to uh, all the people affected by his death. Protect all of our officers as they do uh, dangerous work here and to keep us safe. We thank you for uh, the, the hard work that they do each and every day. Uh, Lord, we thank you for looking after <coughs> Pastor Getka as he recovered from appendicitis and and uh, we just thank you for watching over the family too it's always uh, difficult when a parent goes into the hospital and uh, spends a couple days there uh, you watched over him and we thank you for that you watched over the family and we thank you for that too uh, preserve and, and keep him help the uh, the appendix to uh, stay healthy so that uh, there doesn't have to be any more uh, medical work done on that and bless and preserve him as he continues to serve you. Bless us today and always. In Jesus' name, amen. David, would you go down? Did you go down? I don't. I think I don't. I don't. I don't want any homeless stuff in there. Oh, he'll help you. I got some coming. <coughs> All right, friends. <laughs> Send Dave off on there. All right. <laughs> Okay. The second century. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Ruff. So we're just kind of working our way through um, the history of the New Testament church. And we talked a little bit about the second century last time. Um, the uh, I guess as you think about what was the worship service like, you just kind of had a couple different things. Word and sacrament remain very central to that. Sunday is your day of worship. That's kind of settled on officially then. Um, we had that, if you remember our discussion, we had that separation between the word portion of the service where you had the scriptures, the prayer, um, and then also the uh, Where's there? And also the um, uh, the sermon or the address, however you want to use that. Um, that was kind of one service, and then you'd break, and then you'd have the the communion service. Then following that, and we see that reflected in our liturgy with the repetition of the Lord be with you and also with you. So at the beginning of service, uh, we'll say that, and then in the communion service, we'll do it again because that's kind of a historical reflection that that's when the service sort of restarted after um, uh, fellowship time in between. Um, they also dropped out the agape meal. Um, I'm not exactly sure why. Um, I think maybe just it kind of became, uh, it's, you know, the, the agape meal was meant to be for fellowship um, uh, and to, to celebrate the community, um, but I think it became a target for criticism from outside of the church um, because it became also associated with um, communion, even though 
community wasn't always celebrated as a part of the agape meal. So uh, because of that, and just some of the, just maybe some of the excesses that came as a result, um, it officially dropped out. Not that they stopped celebrating or fellowshipping with each other, but that just sort of fell out. It just, you know, like anything, any custom, if it's not serving the purpose anymore, then you move on, right? You, you reinvent it and move on. So. All right. All right. All right. All right. That's 60 of them now. Six. I just keep wow. printing these things. How many centuries did you print? And they also have one. Copy up there. Copy up there. Copy up there. Copy up there. century now, um, if you want to flip to kind of the back of page uh, two, one, two, three, four, page four, the order of the service becomes more apparent. Page four? Uh, top of the page. The order of the service becomes more apparent. Um, so that's that's where we are at. So we're kind of, uh, where, where this train is headed, where this train is headed, is um, page five of the old Lutheran hymnal. And the reason I chose that is because um, that's sort of the first, um, in our circles, the first kind of full version of the, um, the order of service as connected to the Western Rite as we did it in the Lutheran Church. Not that what we have in Christian worship or the new Christian worship is bad at all. It just seemed like a good place to, uh, to go to. Okay, so, um, so by the second century already, they're starting to put together various forms of worship. So you start with a gathering, right? These are our terms, by the way. A rite is, is just a ceremony, a certain thing you do. Right? Baptism rite, gathering rite, wedding rite, right? Just a, a liturgical function that you do. What the gathering rite is, and we actually are using one officially called a gathering rite, right? Not called the gathering rite for Lent, remember your love, right? It's just a musical piece. The idea is you're gathering everybody in. So the purpose of the gathering rite is, is to just give everybody time to settle in, focus in on the, the worship for the day, stop talking, and pay attention to God's Word, right? So just like today, right, people come in, they want to gather and, and get to know each other and reconnect and all that stuff, and so we'll use the gathering, right? So sometimes there would be like a group of, of choirs, people singing psalms and things like that, just kind of gathering people and getting them ready for the service. I always say that the opening hymn is for all the latecomers, so they can come in and get settled in. <laughs> That's what that opening hymn is in part there for. Okay, um, after the gathering rite, um, then you would uh, move into uh, what they would say is you'd have these readings from the memoirs of the apostles which I think is a lovely phrase. What are those? The memoirs of the apostles. The Say that again? The Gospels? The Gospels, yeah. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The memoirs of the apostles. And that's, that's a wonderful way to think about them, aren't, isn't it? Right? Here are the, the apostles of Christ. They were with him. And they were with him. They were witnesses. And they put this stuff together. Yes. So they would do readings from the memoirs of the apostles and also the writings of the prophets.
Well, now, that's very interesting, isn't it? Because when we do our readings, we read from the Gospels, and we also read from the Old Testament, don't we? So we see, start to see already in the second century, they were already getting together this idea of a selection of readings from the Bible. Um, then there would be some preaching and prayers. Um, there'd also be this thing called the kiss of peace. Um, now, in our culture, we handshake. That's our that's our version, right? But you know how in Europe you get the the, the kiss of welcome, things like that. That's the idea here: is is you're greeting each other. So some some were following the prayers, and a lot of times these would be intercessory prayers, prayers for other people. Um, then would follow this idea of the, the kiss of peace. Um, that's been dropped from our liturgy. Obviously, we don't have that anymore. Um, but it could be perhaps part of the origin of uh, the peace of the Lord be with you always, right? When we say that, that might be where that came from. Where when the pastor said that, maybe then there would be that kind of greeting, that general greeting of each other. So usually, when do we say the peace of the Lord be with you always? That's where. Is that? Oh, and also with you. I was just thinking of that. <laughs> nope, not there. Yeah, that, that seems right. That's after, usually after I say the words of institution, right? Uh, new covenant given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Then the pastor says, the peace of the Lord be with you always. We say amen, and then we sing, O Christ, Lamb of God, right? So that's usually where we say that. So that seems to be maybe where that came from, this sort of general recognition among the people that Christ gives us peace and we share that peace with each other. We still do the passing of the peace in like a lot of Presbyterian churches yes. do like a greeting, yep. the passing of the peace. And that's kind of a similar the, thing too, yep. Where you just say hi to each other yeah. and, and shake each other. It always goes longer than they intend to. <laughs> <laughs> yep, of course. <laughs> of course, yeah. At that point in the service. Um, and then there was the presentation of the bread and wine. And I put a nice quote in there um, from uh, the first apology of Justin Martyr, chapter 66. That's dated about 150 AD, so about 60 years after Revelation was written and published. So this is a very, very early church document that we still have. Justin Martyr um, was probably a disciple of the Apostle John. So when we look at Justin Martyr's stuff, um, we are very close, We're, you know, that kind of first generation after the apostles. And it's very nice to see his stuff because it kind of, in a lot of ways, reflects a lot of what's in, you know, the, the book of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation, those books. Um, because you can see he was definitely a student of the apostle John. But uh, this is what he had to say in his letter here, uh, dated 150. For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise, we have been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word, and from which our body and flesh by transmutation are nourished, what he means is you take it in, right? You're, you're taking that into yourself, is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. For the apostles in the memoirs, there's that word again, in the memoirs composed by them, which are called gospels, have thus delivered unto us what was enjoined upon them, that Jesus took bread when he had given thanks, said this, do ye in remembrance of me, this is my body, and that after the same manner, having taken the cup and giving thanks, he said, this is my blood, and gave it to them alone. So notice how closely that resembles our liturgy during the time of the sacrament when, when we present. So that though, that kind of rite, you know, the rite of, of uh, Holy Communion has been with us for a long time. If already they're doing this in 150 AD, you know, we've been doing this for, what, 1900 some odd years, right? 
So it's a very, very old thing. Okay, then after we're done with communion, uh, we have what's called the Great Thanksgiving. Sorry, I think I jumped ahead here a little, sorry. Um, in between the, um, speaking of the words of institution, is what's what we call the Great Thanksgiving. Um, and what that is, is um, we, we have that kind of reflection in our own liturgy. Uh, we give you thanks, O Lord, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who, and then there's usually some kind of seasonal thing, right? Um, like we're in Lent now, so what's the one from, from common service? Um, who conquered uh, who conquered the devil? Uh, I mean, I'm going to word it wrong, but who, who overcame death? on a tree so that the devil who overcame us by a tree might by a tree be thus overcome. Right? So we've kind of got that little irony in the season of Lent uh, where we talk about the tree of the cross overcoming the serpent who overcame us by the tree of knowledge and good and evil. So that's a reflection of this great Thanksgiving. Now, remember when we did that synagogue service? There was that really long prayer called, the, I think it was called the Adama where they kind of went through everything. Um, you know, creation and, you know, all the blessings that God has poured out in life. That's what kind of got translated here in the Great Thanksgiving, where they would offer a very lengthy prayer, typically starting with creation and going all the way through the time of Israel up until the present day. Just kind of <laughs> listing all of the great achievements that, that God has done. Um, another thing... Um, which disappeared from our liturgy but has since reappeared is uh, something called the Eucharistic Prayer. Has anybody ever heard of this? Anybody ever hear of that one? So you'll, you'll notice this when we switch to the new hymnal is that when we have communion, we won't say the Lord's Prayer until communion. And that's because what we do is in between the, the words of institution, we'll offer a prayer, giving thanks to God, right, for the meal, for the work of Jesus Christ. And then after that prayer, we'll say the Lord's Prayer together and then go into distribution of Holy Communion. So it's still there. It's just we moved it into its more traditional place, believe it or not. Isn't that where it was? In the Lutheran hymnal? In TLH, it might have been. It's been a little while since I've oh, looked yeah, at it. Not. <laughs> <laughs> I was in seventh grade when 93 came out. So. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. But yes, you might be right. You might be right. Dennis? Yeah, I was just thinking about like the frequency of communion. My mom talked about when she was little, and they were in the German church, it was only given once a year. Right. And then twice a year. Right. When I was little, it was only once a month. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, that's kind of changed over the years, the frequency. Yes. Yeah, you know, Luther himself said it should be celebrated more frequently, perhaps as much as twice a year. <laughs> <laughs> so that shows you how often it was being celebrated in, in uh, you know, Renaissance Europe uh, right after the Middle Ages. And I don't have a good reason for why that was the case. Um, except that all of the rites and all of the ceremonies of the Roman Catholic liturgy sort of just became this monstrosity and communion became kind of this afterthought. You know, the priests are doing it anyway all the time, so you don't really need to worry yourself. But on Easter we'll do it. Or on Good Friday we'll do it, right? And that tradition, unfortunately, sort of carried on. So, you know, doing it twice a year was already 100% more <laughs> than you're already doing. So Luther thought that was probably a safe segue. Now once a month is pretty good, and now some congregations we do it like us, we do it twice a month, and some do it every every week now. So what are you going to well, say? I was just curious, if, if it was once a year, did they celebrate it on Monday, Thursday then? I, you know, that's a good question. I think Easter is when they would do it. Yeah. The, the ancient church has, has more of a tradition of the sacrament on the, the high festivals. Um, okay, so, so we'll kind of get used to this again here, coming back into it, Eucharistic prayer. Okay, so then a couple things happened. 
Obviously, we start communion, right? So you're distributing the elements of communion. Um, which involve the reception of Eucharistic gifts. What's this all about? <laughs> this, I'll be curious if anyone, this, this, this is an old school, so you gotta be old school German Midwestern Lutheran <laughs> to get this one. So, and, and it might, you might have only ever heard of this. So, in some congregations, after you're done with communion, you go behind the altar. And behind the altar, you put some money in a plate. And that money is used, anybody know? As, purchase wine. Yes, that's, that's used to purchase the, the bread and the wine for communion. So, is so that you would, why the churches had the self, the freestanding altar with the walkway behind it? Um, I think no. No, I mean, I, I don't think that was the primary reason, but this was the, you know, you could do it that way, right? You could do it that way. So, so you'd finish communion, yep, you'd finish communion, you'd go behind, you drop your offering off again, and then you'd go and sit down. Talk. Yeah, in our church, uh, the way it was is uh, the adults would go for communion, and then when they turn to come back, there would be a stand there. Oh, okay. And it had, uh, I'm not sure what you even call it, but it was a receptacle. It was all satiny. It was white and satiny. Okay. A little slot. And then people would put money in it as they sure. walked out. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, so a very, you know, so, so this, so the idea here was a little bit different. Um, here we're receiving your offering now, <coughs> and part of this was um, uh, your offering to support um, the poor within the congregation. So, so it wasn't so much meant to support the work of the church per se, um, they handled that in different ways, um, but they would then take that money, I'm sure... I'm sure as needed, right? They probably used it for purchasing supplies or whatever. You know, they're, they got to deal with the same stuff that we do. Um, but the, the big reason was then to go out after the church service and share the congregation's gifts with the poor of the congregation. That's really the next part that would happen. Um, and I don't know if they had a special, you know, right of commission or, or something like that, but at this point in the service then, um, there would be this kind of extended distribution to the absent. So the church would send out an agent, a deacon, and that person or persons would go to the houses or places where people couldn't come. So this is how you did your shut-in ministry, is that person would leave the church service with the elements of communion that have been used in that service, and then go and celebrate communion with that person. So here's another uh, connection to our uh, traditions. But first, yes? Well, I was wondering about <clears throat> excuse me, offering and the, the timing of it. I mean you can really probably put it anywhere because you know it's a it's a outpouring of the gospel, right? You hear the gospel and that motivates you. Uh, right, so that's right. what probably motivates right. us. Right. I'm just wondering, it seems like a cool time to take an offering is after distribution. Because you've just come from the supper, you're like, man, yeah. you know, and it, right. I just think that's interesting that there's this, the Eucharistic, reception of Eucharistic gifts, that almost be kind of a cool place to do the offering on a communion Sunday, because it's kind of, you know, I'm justified freely now in my sanctified life, I can yeah. freely. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's a good observation. That is why we call it the offering. Right? We're offering something to God. That's why the organist's music is called an offertory, because they're offering their gift to God. So sometimes people complain. <clears throat> you go to this church where you got a well-established music program, and, ah, oh, we got to sit through this three-minute offertory. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how it sounds, too. Well, at least in my ears. Right? <laughs> and the board just is like, i got to come up with three minutes of music. <laughs> well, the, the, the point so that, what you're saying is... No, no, no. The point, <laughs> the point is, 
is this is the organist's <laughs> opportunity to offer a gift to God on behalf of the congregation, a musical gift that they've been working on the whole week, right? So it's not a performance, and that's a really important thing to remember, right? Yeah, it might sound fancy. Yeah, it should, right? They put hours of work into this, right? It's their offering to God. So that's an interesting reminder for us, right? So next time you hear a long offertory or a long prelude, remember why. Remember why. It's a good thing. Okay, let's get out of the second century, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we covered 100 years in two weeks. I think that's pretty good. I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now we're going to cover 1,200 years. All right. Wow. So the third century to Luther. That's the 1500s. Um, if we're kind of summarizing this period of the church, um, it's a period of great expansion. We're in the third century. Um, the late 200s, right? Uh, we're going to get the Peace of Milan in 333, which will come uh, from Emperor Constantine and his conversion to Christianity, legalizing or at least recognizing Christianity as one of the approved religions of the Roman government, which sounds very strange in our ears, but in, in, the, the, in those days, that was a very important legal recognition because it meant now that Christians could practice their religion openly. They wouldn't have to be afraid of government officials uh, bringing persecution. That doesn't mean that overnight the persecutions just stopped, but it did mean now that, that things were different in the empire. Um, it also meant, you know, if you're a business guy and you want to do business with the government, Becoming Christian was probably an opportune thing to be, right? Because if the emperor is Christian, it makes sense if I'm Christian too. So this rapid expansion of the Christian church was as much a social thing as it was an evangelistic thing. So you kind of have to balance that out a little bit, right? So, and then I'm, I'm painting with a rather broad brush here, but it was the case that, you know, yesterday, it was a pagan temple dedicated to Athena, and on Sunday, they just cleaned out all the pagan stuff and put in a cross, and now it was a Christian church. And it was kind of like that. And so then you came to worship Athena, and all of a sudden, no, 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 it's Christian now. So it kind of flipped in some places, and <clears throat> okay, I guess I'm a Christian now, right? So, so there was a, a period where you had, okay, a lot of people became Christian, <clears throat> but you still had a process of, of education that needed to happen. <clears throat> um, the other thing that characterizes this period, remember, we're going all the way to Luther's day, is, is there's going to be a consolidation of power within the church. So what I mean here is, remember how you had kind of centers of Christianity, like Alexandria in Egypt, or Jerusalem in Israel, or Ephesus in Turkey, or Corinth in Greece, or Rome in Italy, you know, these kind of centers of Christianity um, vied for influence over the other churches. And just kind of gradually, I uh, can thank Pope Innocent III. Um, he was a big proponent of using the, the office of the Bishop of Rome, <coughs> whose nickname was Papa, right? Papa. So that's where we get Pope from. So the Bishop of Rome, Papa, Pope, um, becomes influential then over all the other bishops in the area. And so, you know, let's say Bishop Cam and Bishop Wilcox have a disagreement about something, so we'll go to Bishop Papa Hope over there, and he'll settle the dispute between us, right? And so that kind of gradually improved the influence of the, the Bishop of Rome. That's right. That's right, Gary. But, but wear that mantle carefully, because... Off, off with her heads. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, so, so that, that, you know, the, the papacy became this, this big, uh, hugely politically um, influential thing. You know, you, and, and you get crazy stories where, um, 
is it uh, Charles the Great, Emperor Charles the Great, right, uh, 1200s, and he has to stand barefoot outside in the snow, outside the Pope's home, because he didn't apologize to the Pope for something he did as, as Emperor. And the Pope made him stand outside in the snow and bare feet for like three days or something like that, and then let him in, right? So this is, this is the kind of malarkey that starts going on, right? Or, uh, or one Pope who, who charged the front of the army and said, let's see who has the bigger <coughs> man parts, me or the King of France, right? So this was kind of, th this was the, the uh, corruption that was starting to pour into the office of the papacy. So by Luther's day, um, it was a bit like watching celebrities, you know, and their lives kind of spin apart in front of you because you you had um, anybody know about Lucretia? What's Lucretia? Anybody know that name? Yeah. Lucretia Bor Borgia. Borgia, right? She would poison people, right? She had a ring that she would put a little poison in, and when Daddy Pope, wait, how does the Pope have a child? Well, we won't get into that, but <laughs> and, and she may have been his his wife too, we don't know. You know, there's all kinds of nasty, naughty stuff that's going on, but she would have a little ring with a little bit of poison, and when so-and-so bishop didn't toe the line into the cup, it went, have a drink, Mr. Bishop. And, yeah, so all that kind of stuff was going on. People knew about it, and so, you know, by Luther's day, you know, power had corrupted, right? Power had corrupted, and that's, that's certainly what was going on. Um, and you had uh, uh, kind of a very, very much an organization within the church. So if you look at the Roman Catholic Church today, this is when all that hierarchy is set up. So you've got the Pope, then you've got the archbishops, right? And then each archbishop is a set of bishops, right? And that's what forms your uh, diocese, right? So you've got a diocese here in Tacoma, and there's a bishop over that, and he answers to the archbishop, and, oh, I've read the, coll the College of Cardinals, then, the cardinals above that. So, so, and it's usually from the College of Cardinals that the Pope is elected. So we've been through a few papal elections. That's kind of an interesting thing. Did anybody watch the news on that, when, when those would happen? Okay. You know, all the, all the, the cardinals all come together. Hey, right, right, and they're, everybody's outside waiting for the smoke yeah. to come up the chimney. If it's white smoke, right, they, they, they've found a new pope. If it's black, they haven't. So, um, and what's interesting, and so you had Pope John Paul II, right, and he, he died. Um, where did he retire? Remind me of how this he happened. Died. He died, yeah. So, so he died, and so, we, so then we had um, a rather conservative pope, right, and and he was just for a short period of time, and now we have the, the next pope, Benedict. Um, I shouldn't say we, but you know, we, the world. <laughs> um, and typically, if you look historically over the, over the popes, when you have a pope that was really popular, like John Paul was, the next pope after him is typically a shorter, shorter term as they transition out, and then the next guy is for a longer term. That seems to be that pattern's kind of repeating. <clears throat> so, so interesting stuff there. All that stuff was developed during this time. Okay. So, what are our um, what are our developments in uh, the liturgy here? Our the, the Western right. So the the preface to the sacrament. That's how we have it today. So when, when we say, the Lord be with you, say also with you, uh, we lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord, let us give thanks to the Lord our God, who is good and right so to do, that was, that was what was developed and settled on during that time. So probably in our liturgy, the oldest part of the liturgy. Uh, let's see here. Uh, a few things on this prayer of thanksgiving. Here we get um, the the central 
events of salvation as they would later appear in the Apostles' Creed. And that's, that's an interesting thing because <coughs> we know that the Apostles' Creed is going to come later. That's, that's not something that was around in the first or second century yet. That would come a little later. Apostles' Creed probably generated um, in the areas of, of France or Germany, southern, southern Germany, France area. Um, and so <coughs> the thinking goes then... You know, Lord, we give you thanks for, you know, sending us your son who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Born, you know, so they kind of did that. And maybe those churches then took those thoughts and then added in a few other thoughts. And then, voila, you have the Apostles' Creed, right? Called the Apostles' Creed not because it's written by the Apostles, but because it reflects that apostolic faith. So that's kind of what we think happened there. We get two additional songs here. Um, oops, there's an L there. Of uh, Hosanna in the Highest. Yeah, we know that song. <laughs> yeah. See? <laughs> And then we give you thanks, O oh Lord, Heavenly Father, Almighty God, through Jesus Christ. Um, that that phraseology then being used. So that that gets in there. So you can kind of start to see we're just sort of dropping in the things that are very familiar to us that have received all of this, but it's kind of uh, dropping in bit by bit. All right, let's talk a little bit about a very important person named Cyprian. Um, because Cyprian is um, going to introduce some of the practices in the liturgy that, that we are very familiar with today. So he's the guy that we're, we're crediting with a lot of, uh, a lot of the stuff. All right, so Cyprian, uh, so he was Bishop of Carthage. Who are, my, who are my former Latin students? Anybody take Latin in like high school or college? Okay. What, what's your Latin phrase for Carthage? That, you would have memorized it because it would have been, it would have been an easy way to remember the passive paraphrastic construction. <laughs> Carthago delenda est. Carthago delenda est. Carthago de Lenda Est. All right, so this would be, so you had um, a famous orator, and, and he would give some great speech about something in Rome, and no matter what speech he gave, he would end it with Carthage must be destroyed. Carthage must be destroyed, because that was the big war. Remember the, uh, the Puric Wars between Rome and North Africa? Right? We call it a Pyrrhic victory when neither side wins and they're both just exhausted from war. So this would be, I think there were three of those between Italy and North Africa. So that's where we get Carthage from. That's what I always remember when I think of Carthage. In North Africa, today... Uh, Cyprian's time is early 200s to 258. We have a better date for his death, well, because he's going to be martyred. So he's martyred in Rome. The date that we use is uh, September 14th, 258. That's, his, that's the day we have him in our calendar. Um, and he's known as an important Christian writer of his day. So this is before um, before Christianity is legalized as
as a, a religion. So this happens all before it. But he's the one who standardized the preface to communion. Um, you can thank him or hate him for this one. So he's, he's the reason you have to stand when the gospel is read. He introduced that custom of standing when we read the gospel. Um, he introduced the, what was called the prayer of the faithful. <clears throat> which would be the precursor uh, to our prayer of the church following the offering. So there's kind of two standardized prayers, right? You have the prayer of the day, being the service, and then you have the prayer of the church, which usually follows the sermon. Um, by the way, just by way of note, uh, this was dropped... Um, during the Middle Ages. So Luther, though, uh, would restore it uh, during the Reformation. <coughs> 16th century. So that was something that kind of disappeared uh, from churches for a while, was this prayer of the church. Um, probably because <clears throat> we were spending too much time praying to Mary and we needed to get something out of the way so we had time to do that. Um, all right. That's Cyprian. Important guy. Important guy. We're thankful to him. We'll see him in heaven. Yeah. We're pretty heavily structured. Yeah. Any other, any other organizations that structure as is that, is that the reason why a lot of people run from us? Because they have a structure. Oh, because all the structure. Well, I think... I didn't realize that. I, you know, you got to look at it historically, right? You've got, you've got a Christian organization that's starting, right? And you've got to have some way to produce pastors. You've got to have some way to organize mission work. You've got to have some way to deal with false teaching or questions of doctrine, right? So, and, and you're coming out of a culture and time that was, you know, influenced heavily by Rome. That's why we call it the Western Church, you know, the Roman Church. Um, and we're, we're very much inheritors of all of that. And, you know, Rome liked things organized. You know, they, they liked that. So, um, so I think that's a big part of it. Um, Yes, can it get bureaucratic at times? <laughs> sure can. I never yeah. understand when you, when you said way it was created, why it was created, now I can understand. Yeah. A lot of newer churches in the 20th century or whatever, really, so, they didn't have to go through that. So they, they would just... They just go. They yeah. just go. Yeah, you kind of like think about like the difference between you know a church in our circles. We have a support system called a synod. If I am such and such community church, I may not have a great support system other than maybe another church that's going to sponsor it. Yeah. Right. So, um, so that you know that comes with its own challenges, just like being part of the synod. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, where's Where's Mel? Oh, you ran off on me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Mel works for our district mission board, right? And so they have a bureaucratic process that they have to go through to approve a new mission, yeah. right? If we said, hey, we'd like to start a new church, you know, there's a process we have to go through. It doesn't just happen. But so it comes with its ups and downs. Okay. No, if you go to like a Presbyterian oh, yeah. or an Episcopalian church, you'll see a lot of the same order of service yes. we have in the same hymnal. It's all, you know, it's very similar. Yeah, you know, yeah, if we want to, you know, you can do this kind of thinking here. Um, if you want to kind of do a quick timeline of the history of, of, of Christianity and the, and the church bodies, right? And then you've got... <clears throat>
So you got the time of the apostles, which gave rise to the Catholic Church, little c, and then the Roman Catholic Church, which goes up till about the Middle Ages, to the time of Luther. And then from there, you kind of have three branches then that, that come out of it, right? The Roman Catholic Church continues. You've got um, the Lutheran Church, and then you have the, the, the Protestant or the Reformed tradition. And those are really still to this day your kind of your three main branches of Christianity. Well, and tell like the Church of England kind of came out of up in there too. It's better for us then, right? Yeah, you know, because that actually started before Lutheran. Because that, the Methodists came from that branch of a breakup of the Church of England, which right. started in the 1400s before Lutheran. Began. Yeah, you know, right. You could, I suppose, put C of E in here. Is that one? I think from from the outside, the C of E is probably more similar to Roman Catholicism. But of course, Church of England, why were they started? Because Henry VIII needed a wife that would produce a baby. And so he needed to divorce his wife. The Pope wouldn't let him. So so I said, fine, I'll just make a new church. <laughs> Isn't it great to be the king? <laughs> so, so the Church of England's kind of goofy from that standpoint. Um, but interestingly enough, um, I forget who the head bishop was for the Church of England when it started. Um, but he he appealed to Luther because you know they they thought, oh okay, you're rebelling against the Catholics. We're rebelling against the Catholics. Maybe maybe we have some commonalities here. Of course, Luther's like, no 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 no. <laughs> but but and this is to maybe your point here is. Um, Lutheranism lost its way kind of in the 17th century. And as a result of it losing its way, it sort of abandoned the, the Western Rite, the liturgy that we're talking about here. But you know who kept it? It was the Church of England in the Book of Common Prayer. And so when Lutheranism wanted to rediscover its historic liturgy again, it went back to the Church of England, to the Book of Common Prayer, and a lot of the stuff in the Lutheran hymnal is taken right out of the Book of Common Prayer. So, so there is a lot of sharing that happened as a result of that. Yeah. So that's why you see a lot of that stuff still in these other church bodies. So the Lutherans had no problems, as well as you know, like kind of this group up here had no problems continuing to use the Western Rite. Luther just got rid of all the bad stuff, you know, the prayers to Mary, the idolatry, you know, all the, all the silly things that didn't do anything to communicate the gospel. Whereas the Protestant and the Reformed tradition, they were more iconoclastic. They wanted to get rid of everything, you know, get rid of the statues, get rid of the artwork, get rid of the ornamentation, get rid of the hymns, Right? All we're going to do is focus on the word, the word, the word, and that was the main focus. So, a lot of times, and you see it even to this day, what is the color of a non-denominational pulpit? or non-denominational preacher you've seen standing at a, at a podium? What color is it? They might. They usually have their Bible Brown. open. No? There wasn't any. Kind of. It's clear. It's clear. It's made out of plexiglass. Right? Because we don't need to worry about the thing holding the book. Right? We're, we're talking about the word, the message. Right? So... So why have an ornamentation on your pulpit? Why, why make the pulpit look like this solid piece of wood? Right? We're not worried about ornamentation. We're just worried about the communication of the message. Right? You see the difference? Whereas, why would we make the pulpit look like a solid piece of wood? Why might we do that? What does that represent? What does that instill? A solid foundation. Yeah, a foundation, a solid, right? This is the solid word of God we're standing on, right? And also a safe place to hide behind when you say something your parishioners don't like. 
I'm just kidding, of course. Right? So, um, so again, your, your worship goals, your theological emphases are going to play a role in how you design your worship space. So, um, so yeah, this, this kind of the three, what I like to call the three trees or the three rivers of Christianity, you still see it today. Like, so, and, you know, if you can kind of keep these three things in mind, you can understand a little bit why the church is the way it is in America. You know, because this group here, the Protestant Reform, is huge, right? Out of this comes all your charismatics, comes all your Baptists, comes all your non-denominationals, comes like Salvation Army, Pentecostal, right? All of the various versions. There's also something called, uh, <laughs> I, won't bother, I won't bore you with it. It's a really interesting religion um, that kind of came out of uh, charismatic religion. It's a non-Trinitarian religion. Um, but was, was hugely influential in the African American community um, around the same time that a lot of those charismatic groups, like Foursquare Gospel, would come out of there, all that, all that stuff. So, okay. Where did the Puritans fit in? Uh, yep, they fit in Protestant Reformed. So, so the Baptists would go up to England and start there, and then the Puritans and stuff like that. Charles uh, Cromwell. You know, Oliver, you know, Oliver, sorry, hey, Oliver Cromwell, right? The great Puritan leader of England, right? Who was then finally taken care of by <laughs> rather ignominious end there. So, yeah. I want to pick up what some Gary had said earlier I thought was interesting about is that sometimes why people run because we're so structured? It's, it's kind of sad though, you look at our society and a lot of the things we've talked about, even like the color of a pulpit, unfortunately, some people don't stop to think that long. And it's just not, not that they can't think that deeply, but I wonder if part of that is why they have a struggle with our worship services, because unfortunately the rest of their life is so unstructured, they're not used to it. I wonder they, You know, like, it's an interesting thought, and it's, you, you just go, you can't, and that, this sounds bad, but you're, you can't pay attention long enough to look deeper than, what are we doing right this second? <laughs> you know, it's, and, and it makes you wonder, kind of like, oh, how do you reach those who, you know, can't see past the, oh, this is boring, to, this has meaning, you know, yeah, but you have to take long enough for that to permeate, that, that's, I've been thinking since you said that. Yeah, that, thus that. We, we have to have, that's you know, opportunities like this to Not that, I'm not saying we, not that we ch necessarily change, but the way we think about yeah. someone who hasn't ever done church before, right? That's a, that might be a big deal, just the fact that we are structured, and that's a good thing. So but it's going to be a new experience. Yeah. 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 I just say, on the same line, that's kind of what I'm hearing from people that, say used to come here or just don't come that often is there we're seeing you're still doing the same old stuff the stuff <laughs> from years ago uh, why can't you have something new something that, that's more inspirational or exciting you know and what, what, you know, what is it that, yeah, right. you know, why, 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 uh, why, why should I go to your church because you're going to have the same people do the same thing over and over and over it's yeah, like well, the guy that happens. I come here, and you have the same same thing in there at Christmas and Easter or something. Right. You know, yeah. I'm always seeing the same. Yeah, same, the same thing. Well, what's funny about that, you know, right? So, <laughs> I, I'm just teasing a little bit here. Okay, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, but uh, what if on Easter Sunday? I don't use the same hymns anymore. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'll be yeah. Learning, right? I, I, I did that once. I didn't do. I didn't. I didn't do. Um, I know that I could do my lives on Sunday. Wow! I got, I got blasted the next Sunday. It's just not Easter without that hymn. I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure Jesus still rose from. So this Easter, you can believe in the Easter Bunny and everything instead of. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's that careful balance, right, between variety right, right, and innovation and, and having a consistency, right, that you can rely upon. And um, I did just read an article um, written by an evangelical group uh, called Crosswalk, crosswalk.com, um, and it was um, five, five things that are killing the church. And one of them was this attitude that we have to always be innovative and appeal to the youth and yeah. be youthful and relevant. 
and we're relevant, relevant, they're relevant right? right? And and we're not, you know, as if catering to quote unquote old people is such a bad thing, right? You know, so this was kind of out of the evangelical community. So there is kind of a come to Jesus moment amongst I think the Protestant and Reformed circles that maybe we went a little too far in the 1970s and the 1980s in pulling away from all of the traditional elements of worship. Maybe we went a little too far because if you're going to divorce yourself from everything that's come before you, then you're responsible then for creating new forms that are going to do just as well or better than the old ones did. And that's an experiment, isn't it? Right? It's like, like if we're going to start a new country, right? We're going to start a new country today. What are you going to do? Well, we're not going to look at any of the history at all. We're just going to start a new country and do it ourselves, right? We'd say that might be kind of foolish, right? Right. So uh, that's why there's value in studying history and why we're taking a, a good amount of time here to see what what problems were they trying to get at? How did they develop these things? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> there's a sign, uh, a road sign in Wisconsin, or at least there used to be, uh, and the sign said, "Without heritage, every generation must start over." Yeah. And so that applies to family, that applies to religion, and that applies going back to these evangelicals. You skip something, you skip a generation. And it's all gone. Yeah. Now what do you have? Right, right, yeah. So if you throw stuff out, or at least too much, you wind up with nothing. Stop. And maybe this is a good stopping point, is a little story from uh, the days of Luther. Um, and we'll pick it up with a piece of Milan next time. Uh, is, uh, so Luther is, is in the, the uh, castle of Wartburg, right? And, and he's there, why? Because his life is in danger, right? Okay. Emperor Charles V has put a price on his head. So Luther spends some time there in the castle of Wartburg, writing letters, translating New Testament to Greek, or from Greek into German, all those good things that we remember. But things were not going well in dear old Wittenberg. Back in Wittenberg, um, the other Lutherans went wild. Um, and I mean that quite literally. They took statues, they tore them down, they broke windows, they forced people who had never, ever, ever, ever in their life had communion wine to drink communion wine for the first time in their life without any education, without any understanding of what they were doing. They just said, we're making a clean break with Roman Catholicism and here we go, right? And Luther, when he came back, he preached a week, one solid week, and this was basically the message, you idiots, <laughs> what are you doing? First of all, you leaders, how could you possibly do this to your poor people who don't know anything better, who haven't had any of this stuff, how could you possibly do that? And you people, how could you go along with this? You know better from the God's word. So for a whole week he had to fix this problem, and then peace was restored. So it just shows you what happens when you try to be radical, right? And I think sometimes that's an attractive thing, right? Because mavericks and kind of things, especially American culture, right? Go do it our way, right? You know, be mavericks, go and go and be solo people. Um, but we don't always think necessarily what what does that cause for people? And so so that that's why I kind of go back to what Luther said about communion. You know, let's do it twice a year. You know, Luther was very concerned about making sure that people understood the reason for any of the changes and innovations that that he uh, was espousing, and and why it's important to be careful about implementing new practices, um, like you're saying. You know, understand where it came from, and then understand the purpose for which you're doing it. It's an interesting uh, story from those days <coughs> that uh, is a cautionary tale for us, too, to, to just continue to know <coughs> our history. Yes, ma'am? What was the book that I borrowed from you that speaks so much to form and function and the balance between form and function? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. It just is a really good tool, I guess, reading that book in the, the balance between form and function. Yeah, that was uh, Dave Valesky, right? 
that book by Dave Valesky. So you might remember Dave Valesky, Pastor Valesky had come here and helped for a little while. And yeah, he wrote this uh, good just kind of manual on gospel ministry. And I can't remember the name of it either off the top of my head, but um, yeah, how are you doing it, right? What form are you taking? And what's, what's its purpose going to be? And when you, when you really think those two things through carefully, then you can be a church that has organ preludes and three-minute offertories, or you can be a church that has a garage band in front rocking out every Sunday, right? But you're going to have an understanding of why you're doing that, and, and it's going to be a way to bring people in, right? And, of course, I use kind of two extreme examples of which you get my point. All right. Well, we, we made it almost through the 1500s, but we're going to back up to 313 to talk about the Peace of Milan. But don't worry, don't worry. We are making progress through the centuries. Oh, one last thought here. Come on in, guys. What's the difference? Well, I don't know, several years ago or a few years ago where there was a study done. So the younger people really like the liturgical style because of the form and Yeah, we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about about you know where are people at. I'll just say this: young people need adults in their life, right? So, and obviously that's duh, of course, right? Which means it's it's our responsibility to help them understand why they're doing what they're doing in a church service. If 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 I appealed to the young people, first of all, what group am I talking about? Am I talking about a 13-year-old or am I talking about a 22-year-old? Right? That's that's quite a age range there. So um, so I think we have to understand that and and, and realize that um, we have you know and not to not to sound too flippant, but we got to be the adults in the room that are going to say. Here's, here's how we're doing things, and here's why we do things, and invite them into that conversation to be a part of it, um, but to recognize that if we take a consumerist approach to how we do ministry, how we do ministry, would we ever preach the law? Would, would we ever tell somebody, because you are a sinner, you're going to go to hell? No, we wouldn't, right? So we have to be really careful about. You know, and I don't disagree with the survey results or anything like that, but okay, so that's what a survey says. Sure, but what do people need? Right? They need a savior. They need to know their savior. So we have to be careful about appealing to every whim of, of the culture, because if we do that, we're going to wind up flitting away from the truth of the gospel and, and everything that goes <clears throat> up for grabs. What do you want to do today? Well, I don't know. Slippery slope. Yeah, right? What's, well, what do, what do the marketing departments say, right? <laughs> right? Get, get a group in for uh, for the, the church uh, uh, panel to, to talk about our next marketing campaign. I'm not saying any of those things are necessarily wrong or bad, but form will follow function a little bit. You know? So if our function is to appeal to the entertainment needs of people, then all of a sudden the form of worship or the form of how we do ministry is going to start accommodating that. That, that can be a dangerous thing. So, okay. What's to talk about as we move forward? Let's, let's offer a short prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this time as we look over the history of your church. Bless us as we continue to carry your word through the nations. In your name we pray. Amen. Leave the tables and chairs this week. Leave them. Leave them.